Okay, so suppose we have the model, how do we estimate the weights, the, the coefficients beta? That's the question. Well, this was Cox's, I think, really ingenious idea, this idea of partial likelihood. And the magic of it is they don't have to specify that baseline hazard, which we've been saying so ni nicely is unspecified, without, one does not have to specify it and st can still get a, a good estimate of the coefficients beta. And we're going to use, what is done is the same kind of sequential and time logic that was used to derive the, the Kaplan-Meier curve and the log rank test. So, if, if we're at a given time yi, then the total hazard for all the people at risk at that time is just the sum of their hazards, right? Here it is. So, the, this is sum over all, all people that were still at risk at a given, they hadn't died or been censored by time yi, okay? Then suppose we look at the, the relative risk of the person who died at that time versus all the people who are at risk, right? So it, it kind of imagine that at, at a given time we have a, a, a bag of colored balls and with a certain probability we grabbed one of them, that's the ball that had the event, but we could have grabbed one of the other ones. So th 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 that's what's happening here, that the, the people that are at risk that could have died, here's their total risk. And here's the person that actually we observed to die at that time. Here's his risk, his or her risk. Oh, I see. So you're saying, what's the chance that the person who actually died was, what's the probability that they died the, given their amount of risk? Right. And in the denominator, you got all the risks that were sort of adding up to the pool. Exactly. What's the chance it's the actual death? And the very nice thing is that being a relative risk, these H0, the baseline hazards cancel, and we get a function that's free of H0. Hmm. So whatever H0 is, we don't care, we get this relative risk. So this is the probability of, under the model of seeing the person die who died, of observing the person who died to actually die, among all those that could have died. Yeah. Okay. And notice the cancellation. So now we simply, just like we multiplied the Kaplan, remember the Kaplan-Meier, we took products of conditional probabilities. Now we take the, the products of these probabilities, right? Uh, which we, we, have, we just derived one for one risk set, now it's for all of them. Remember, any, yeah. any likelihood is the, the, the product, if you have a sample of independent samples, the, the product of the probabilities of each of the observed right. samples. So yeah, it's the same thing, except they, these, uh, this is the partial likelihood. Exactly. So this is, in a sense, the, the probability of seeing, of observing what we observed uh, under the model, which is what likelihood is. And then we're going we're gonna to find the values of the parameters, the betas, that make, make this the highest. So make the observed data the most likely under the model. And that's what maximum likelihood is all about. So here's an example. Again, the same example before. We have three failures, the gold circles, and these censored observations. And th th these are the relative risk functions for each of the three failures, just like we saw before. They only computed at the death times. Exactly. Just like in Kappa Meyer, we only compute the prob conditional probabilities at the death times. But the censored observations, they appear in the denominators as well as future right. death times. And you can see them here, right? Right. So for the first failure, we compute that relative risk function for a beta. Second, we compute the relative risk function there. Third, and we take their product, and this is the partial likelihood. It's just a function of beta which is a p-vector of our weights for our features, and now we maximize this function over beta. As in the case of, of a lot of the models we've seen, like logistic regression, we, there's no closed form solution, so we have to apply an iterative algorithm, but have to, if it's no problem. It's done very, very easily now in software. And not only do we get the, what's called the maximum likelihood estimate, the partial likelihood estimate, we, we get uh, the other, other goodies that we've seen in least squares and logistic regression. For example, we get p-values that correspond to typical no hypothesis, like beta j equals zero. Right, that's often what we want to know. Is a feature important? Is it contributing to the, the risk of a patient? As well as standard errors and confidence intervals. So all, all the goodies we've seen from analysis of variance and regression, we get them here in partial likelihood as well, in partial likelihood. Okay, well, we've seen the, the regression method. We have a regression method in hand. We've seen the log rank test. You remember in regression, we test for coefficient being zero. In the case where the, the regressor is just a single zero one, what we get is something equivalent to the t-test. We remember this from our regression. So if it's a, a linear model and you've right. only got a single predictor, right. and let's say it's a male-female predictor, right. zero, one, right. and you test its coefficient, yep. and what Rob's saying is that's, that's equivalent to just doing a, a two-sample t-test. Right. 
if it wasn't equivalent, we'd be pretty upset, wouldn't we? Because we'd have two, two very sensible ways of, of testing the same thing. If they didn't agree, we'd be, I think we wouldn't be happy. But in regression, they do agree, and it turns out the same thing happens here. We are now, we have the log rank test and Cox's proportional hazards model, and the case when there is a single predictor taking on two values, well, we could either get fit a Cox proportional hazards model or perform a log rank test. Well, it turns out there's a bit of detail in the book. To extract a, a test from the Cox proportional hazards model, there's actually two or three different ways to do it. But one popular way is known as a score test. And happily, it turns out that in case of a single binary covariate, the score test for testing beta equals zero in Cox's proportional hazards model is exactly equal to the log rank test. So just like the t-test and regression agree in linear models, in, in Gaussian linear models, the score test for Cox's proportional hazards model is exactly the same as the log rank test. So it's, an, it's a nice tidy connection. Okay, some things we haven't discussed in the proportional hazards model. You might uh, have noticed that there's no intercept in the model. And why is that? Well, if you look back at the model, if we put an intercept here, a beta zero here, we'd get an, an, an e to the beta zero, which we could just absorb into h zero of t, right? Because that was unspecified anyway. So I can put whatever, whatever I want into here that's from here. I can transfer it into here if it's not a function of x, and I wouldn't change the model. And it would cancel out as well when you do those ratios too. Exactly. So there's no information about it. Right. So there's no point in putting an intercept because it doesn't contribute. We've talked about a bit about in the log rank test the possibility of tied failure times, right? If, if time is measured discreetly, like in months, you might often get more than one failure or death at a given failure time. And those are called, called tied failure times. As I mentioned, the log rank test can handle those seamlessly. Well, the Cox model can handle them as well, but it's a little more complicated. But if, if you look in the software, which we mentioned at the end of the course, it's all been uh, figured out by smart people over the years. But, and you might be wondering, wh why the name partial likelihood? Turns out it's not a full likelihood in a sense, it, and this is again a much more technical topic, but because of the way it's constructed with this unspecified H0 of t, it's very convenient, but it's not what's called full maximum likelihood, but it's a very good approximation. So if you're interested more in the under underlying theory of this, um, I uh, suggest you read more. Now, the and we started off talking about the Kaplan-Meier survival curves and how the survivor function was sort of a very, a very important summary of survival data. Well, from the Cox model, with covariates, you also are interested not just in the relative risk parameters, but also the underlying survival curve. Now it's a function of t given x, right? You'd like to say, given an individual with certain feature vector, like males or females or males with certain clinical measurements, what is a predicted survival curve? And you can get that from the Cox model as well. The entire predicted survival curve as a function of their features. So that's a bit different from regression, right? Usually with regression, we just measure the mean of the response given x at any particular x. Here we get an estimate of the entire distribution. Exactly. So let's look at now at the proportional hazards model applied to the brain cancer data. And again, here's, I mentioned you get an ANOVA style table. Here are the, the features. Here's the coefficients, the standard errors, the, the Z statistic, which is the ratio, and a two-sided p-value. And again, this is a, a multivariate model, much like the multivariate models we saw in regression. They're all fit together. And Karnofsky index is the only one who's got a, actually, not the only one, but th these the two. Diagnosis, have, uh, one yeah. of the diagnoses is also very significant. Yeah, High-grade glioma, yeah. right. And again, this is, you know, this is one of the brilliant um, aspects of this uh, Cox proportional hazards model, because it yeah. takes this complicated problem with centering and, and so on, yeah. and it casts it as a, as a regression problem right. with all the usual statistics. It makes it very usable, and that's part of the reason it caught on. Right, and, and the interpretation is in terms of a relative risk. So looking at Karnowski index, uh, this X, the, remember, this, minus, this beta of minus 0.05 means that the Relative risk is exponential of, of minus 0.05, which is 0.95. So it's saying that, that if you have each unit, a, right? a, in, in, a, a one unit increase in Karnofsky in, index corresponds to a decrease in the relative risk of 5%. So that's something that's often confusing, to get, making sure you get the signs of the coefficients, their interpretation correct, right? Mm. Here it's negative, 
which you might normally think is a bad thing, but actually because it's a relative risk that's being modeled, being negative here is good, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it's decreasing the relative risk. So that's an important detail to keep in mind. And this just uh, reports the p-value, which was truncated here, but it's actually it was from the actual table is 0 0.0027. Another example, the publication data set, which is mentioned in the, in the chapter, this is the, the time to publication of journal papers reporting the results of clinical trials reported by the NIH. 244 trials, and the outcome is a time of months until publication. 88 of them were not published at all, so they were censored during the study period. So this many were published, and the remainder were censored. They weren't yet, yet published. So the outcome is time until publication. Lots of covariates here, and well, I won't read, read through all of them here, but the, the, the one of particular interest was whether or not the, if the clinical trial had, had a significant positive result, was it, was it more likely to be published earlier, right? Which is something that I think people, some people believe. So that this study was one to look at whether the, the, the positive result of the clinical trial increased the chance of it being published more quickly. And they, I wanted to adjust for lots of different possible confounding factors. Here's the Kaplan-Meier curves for the two groups. So ignoring the other features at this point, just looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves, it doesn't look like there's much difference. And sure enough, the log rank test has a p-value of 0.36. So this is, again, this negative and positive result refers to the, whether the clinical trial reported a negative or positive result for the, the treatments being compared. And it looks like um, there's not much difference. And that's ignoring all the other right. features. Right. But when we do a multivariate analysis, again, using Cox's proportional hazards model, what do we have here? We have a very significant p-value for positive result, right? The standard error, coefficient standard error in the z-score, and the impact score of the journal was also important, and some other guys were marginally important. So, so what's happened here, Trevor? How could it be that these survival curves are so similar, but this is strongly significant? It must have been confounded. <laughs> So there's some right. confounding factors here that we right. had to adjust for. Right, which is the reason one, one does these kinds of multivariate analysis yeah. to adjust for other, other confounding factors. And now the adjustment's been quite dramatic. It now shows that a, a, po a strong positive effect for, for um, a positive result in terms of shortening the publication time. Okay. We can actually go one step further with, the, in the, with this multivariate model to produce adjusted survival curves. So you want survival curves the S of T given X, the estimated survival curves for positive or negative results, and we want to adjust for the other features. Well, when we first plotted those two curves, right. they were sort of averaged over the other features. Right. You know, the positive result group and the, and the negative result group, yep. just averaged over all the features. And if those features were differently distributed in those two groups, that's when you have confounding. So now we're going to make sure the features are the same in the two groups when we look right. at the two curves. That means we have to choose some value for those other features. So, and one can choose any values, but sort of the mo most reasonable is to use the mean. So we, we use the mean value for each predictor for things that are, which are not categorical. And for the categorical prediction, um, MEC, which is the, the, the mechanism of funding, we use the most prevalent category, R01. So we set the features to some fixed value so we can make a, now a, a clear comparison between positive and negative. Oh, and look at that. And now we see a, a clear difference between the survival curves. Yeah. What has happened? Well, you already answered that. Okay.